And if you're crashing those auditions, they are extremely frowned upon. And honestly, you most likely won't get seen anyway. Welcome back to MT's Corner with Naisha Tierra, where we discuss everything involving acting. Make sure you like, comment, and share. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you can be there every single time I post a new video. Hi, everybody, and welcome to MT's Corner with Naisha Tierra. And I'm Naisha Tierra. And today, we are talking about crashing EPA. And if you don't know what EPA is, stay tuned. You're going to find out. Let's start with crashing auditions. What does that actually mean? Now, the definition for crashing auditions is that you're going to an audition that you were not invited to. And in this case, we're talking about equity principal auditions. Now, an EPA means equity principal audition. And what that is, is something that was set in place by the union, the AEA, Actors Equity Association, so that there is an even playing field for both non-union and equity actors who are in the union. Now, there is a difference between EPAs ECCs and equity principal specific auditions. Now, don't get too excited. I know I just threw a lot of acronyms at you, but we're going to break them all the way down. Now, EPA auditions are normally looking for lead actors in musicals and in straight play productions. Now, ECC auditions are equity chorus calls which is for mostly musical dancers. Equity specific auditions are specifically for just that show. Now, EPAs normally have a general audition where it's for a show's entire season. So you can be auditioning for up to five to seven different shows. In some cases, you won't even know what show you're auditioning for. Some shows have their breakdowns listed as show one, show two, and they won't give you much description on what they're doing because they haven't secured the rights to those shows just yet. Now, equity specific auditions are similar to EPAs. The only difference between equity specific show auditions and EPAs is that when we're doing equity specific auditions, they're looking for characters for specific shows that they have already decided on this season. So you can go to an equity specific audition and only audition for one show in particular because that is a show that they are determined to cast at that moment. We're going to talk about crashing EPAs versus crashing invite only auditions. First rule of thumb, do not crash invite only auditions. You were not invited. On purpose. Now, when you're doing your audition search for these equity auditions, you're going to see EPA listings and equity invite only listings. Now, don't get tripped up because these listings are extremely similar. You'll look at them side by side and they kind of look the same. The only difference is, is they will say on the invite only equity auditions, invite only. And what that means is do not attend, do not crash those auditions. Those are not EPA auditions. Now those auditions, the equity actors have to sign up for a time slot. And if you're crashing those auditions, they are extremely frowned upon. And honestly, you most likely won't get seen anyway. Long story short, if you're a non-union or an EMC, you're not getting seen at an invite only audition. The first thing you need to do on your journey to becoming an EPA crashing genius is get you a journal. Now, me personally, I keep a personal journal, and that is where I keep all my auditions that I go on for theater auditions. Now, what do you want to hold in this journal, you may ask? Well, I'm going to get into it right now. First, what did you wear? Second, what show and what theater are you auditioning for? Third, what headshot are you using? Fourth, what monologue and or song are you using? And fifth, and one of the most important, Who's in that room? If you have attended an EPA before, then you know there's a printout sheet normally by the monitor on the front door that lets you know who will be in that room and what shows you'll be auditioning for that day. Now, don't feel that you have to write all of that down because you're thinking about your audition and how you're going to present yourself. Take a picture of it, write it in your journal once you get home. Now, the reason why it's important to know who is in that room is because you need to know who has seen you before and how long ago they've seen you. If these people have seen you more recently and you're using a monologue that they've already seen you do, I'm gonna need you to pick another monologue. Let them see that you've grown. Let them see the range that you're going on. They don't wanna see the same monologue from you that they saw from you two weeks ago. Now, so you don't have to freak out when you first get to an audition and you look at the who's in the room, just know that in EPA audition notices, they normally tell you who will be in the room on the casting notice. Now, that may change from time to time. However, at least you can prepare yourself in advance. So if you see on the casting notice, it's someone you've auditioned for in the span of the last two months, 
you can prepare yourself not to do the same monologue or song you've already shown them. Next, time management is very important. Now, we're located in Chicago, and I can tell you, transportation can be tricky sometimes. A lot of these equity principal auditions happen in the downtown area. I personally am on the south side. I also have a car. So I have a bit of privilege where I can decide when I leave home, but only to an extent because traffic is always going to catch you up. If you think you have enough time, reevaluate that and add an extra hour on. Let's use, for example, that you're attending an EPA that starts at 10 a.m. into 6 p.m. with a lunch break from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. And these auditions are Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And they'll be taking place downtown. Now, the questions you have to ask yourself is where are you located? Are you located in Chicago? Are you close to downtown? These factors will factor into how early you need to get up that morning. And depending on your destination from downtown to where you actually live, that can determine what transportation you use as well. Some areas in Chicago have great transit systems. Some, you have to catch a bus, then you have to catch a train. Some, you just have to use an Uber. Some, you could just walk down the street. And if you could just walk down the street, let me tell you something. You are some of the minorities, and guess what? More kudos to you. Now, if you are not a morning person, when it comes time for EPA season, you got to get used to being a morning person. And me personally, I am not a morning person, okay? So when, it takes me a minute to wake up. So I set several alarms on my phone because I am prone to oversleeping. Now, if we're going with the model that the audition starts at 10 a.m., to be honest with you, the earliest you should arrive to that audition should be 7 a.m. And the latest should be 8 a.m. Now, hold on. I know you're thinking, but the audition doesn't start until 10 a.m. And that thinking will get you to be number 50 on the list. And what list? We'll get into that in a second. Now, before you leave your house, make sure you have some critical things in place. A lot of our EPAs in Chicago normally happen during the wintertime. So take that into account when packing your bag for the day. Also, make sure you have your headshot and resume and make sure it is stapled. You will be surprised how many auditions I go to and people's headshot and resumes aren't stapled. That shouldn't be something you have to worry about when you're trying to make sure that you have the right look, your right monologue, your levels are together, your tone is right, your projection is together when you're there waiting for your audition to start. Set yourself up for success. Staple your headshot and resume ahead of time so that that's one less thing you have to worry about. Granted, some monitors, you'll be able to have a stapler from them, but don't make that a guarantee. All monitors don't have a stapler out there. Sometimes you'll be lost in the wind and you don't want a resume to detach from a headshot and we don't know who you are. Let's get into that list I just talked about. Now, you can also set yourself up for success by bringing a sheet of paper with you and some tape. And you may be wondering, well, what is that for? That is for the list. If you are the first person to arrive, that is your job, quote unquote, to get that piece of paper, tape it onto the wall, write whichever part you are a part of. And when I say whatever part, whether you are a non-union member or whether you are an EMC, put your number on there as number one and write your name. That is the unofficial audition list. Now, if you are the first person to arrive, like I just stated, wait until there are at least 10 people who sign up after you before you leave to go do something else. Especially when we're talking about severe cold temperatures, like in Chicago, no one should freeze to death, and especially not for anybody's equity audition. When you plan your day, you should also take into account the free warm spaces that you can hang out in until it's time for that audition. In those warm spaces, I'm talking about the library. I'm talking about coffee shops. Places like that where you can sit and drink something or be idle and keep your eye on the clock until it is time for you to go back and they open the doors for your audition. Now, if we're going with the model for 10 a.m. is when the auditions start, I would say head back to your audition location at 9 a.m. and 9.30 at the latest because that is when they will open the doors and start to let y'all into the waiting area. Now, I know I said that if you're the first person there, you get that piece of paper, that tape, you put it on the wall, put your name next to number one, and wait for at least 10 people to show up before you go retreat for warmer weather. However, if you're not the first person to show up, make sure that you sign the right list when you arrive. Sometimes there will be others who have already made lists. And when I say list with an S, I mean there will be an equity list. 
there will be a EMC list and there will be a non-union list. Make sure you are signing the correct list because if you are not, it will mess you up and no one's going to give up their slot just because you were number one and you signed the equity list when you're non-union. Now there are some golden rules about the list, but the most important thing to remember is this list that you wrote out, it's not a real list. It's not the official list. However, in Chicago, everyone for the most part goes by this list when it's time to transfer it onto the list that the monitor actually has. So what that means is when the monitor lets you into the room at 9 a.m. or 9.30, you're going to see them take those lists, put those lists on the table next to them, and then they're going to present a printed out version of that list. Not with any names, just with the titles of equity, EMC, and non-union. Now, everyone upholds this list for at least the first 15 minutes, which means that if you signed your name as number one on the non-union list, the printed out monitor list will allow you to also transfer the unofficial names and numbers to the official list. Now this is more of an unwritten rule for Chicago. However, this doesn't always play out in bigger cities and states like New York. From what I understand there, you can write your name as number one on that list all you want to in that unofficial list. But if you're not there when the monitor lets everyone into their waiting room, believe that number two is gonna write themselves as number one and you're just gonna be out of luck because you didn't take into account time management. Don't let yourself and your number on that list and all the hard work you took to get up early this morning, bring your journal, staple your headshot and resume, and do all these things you needed to do to set yourself up for success go in vain. Pay attention to the time. Now, the monitor is doing us a service by allowing us to use that unofficial list and transferring it over into the official list. They don't have to actually do that. Also, just so you know how these lists go, just because someone wrote their name on the list doesn't mean they're gonna get seen right away. This is how it works. All scheduled equity actors who already scheduled an audition in advance will be seen first. Then second will be equity actors who are walk-ins. Then third will be EMC actors who wrote their names on the list. Fourth will be EMC actors who just arrived and are now writing their name on the list when it's 11.30. And finally, fifth will be non-union actors. Now, I know you're thinking to yourself, oh my God, I'm fifth on the list. Are you serious? I mean, I'm not going to get seen. But that doesn't necessarily make that true. Also, when you're taking into account time management, make sure your whole day is free. Now, I know that's a lot to ask, but if you're looking at these auditions and you're planning them in advance, then you have a little wiggle room to be able to take off work or figure out what you're going to do leading up to that day so you can have complete availability. Also, don't fret because you're number five on that list because depending on what day it is and what time it is, you may be seen first. Let's say you're going to the audition on a Thursday. It's going to be more unlikely that equity actors are actually going to be there at 10 a.m. I'm just being honest because I've gone to plenty of equity auditions and they don't start showing up that early. So if you're number one on your list, nine times out of 10, you're going to be seen between 10 and 12, especially if you're arriving on a Thursday. Now, let's move on to the monitor. Now, sometimes you never know who that monitor is going to be. So the golden rule of thumb with that is be kind to everyone. Some of these monitors are ensemble members at these theaters. Some of these monitors know someone who knows someone, and they can be determining factor whether you get a gig or not, or at least a call back. So always treat them with kindness. I'll use, for example, I myself have been a monitor for a theater company that I was an ensemble member at. And I've had some auditionees who were a bit rude and didn't take the monitor seriously. We do report back to those who are auditioning you for their shows. If we tell them you have a bad attitude and you thought your audition was great and you don't get a call back, it's probably because they didn't like your attitude with the monitor. So make sure you are being kind to people at all times. Also, when you arrive and you see the monitor, you can ask them questions. They're kind of like the 411 hub for you. Ask them if the people that are supposed to be in the room are going to be in the room for the entire audition or are they coming in at certain points of the audition? Because sometimes those who are supposed to be in the room do not attend the entire audition process. Some of them only attend pieces of the audition process. So if you're looking for a specific person that you want to impress again with a new monologue, a new piece, go to that monitor and see when the time frame who you would like to see the most is going to be in that room. And last but not least with the monitor, 
Some of them are just there to give you that stapler. If they have one, that is. Now, let's move on to the waiting area. Now, the waiting area is somewhere you're going to be spending a lot of time. So when you arrive in that waiting area after you've already signed your name on the list, talk to the monitor about who's going to be in that room. Locate the bathroom, okay? Locate it so that you can get yourself together. Me personally, I like to go in the bathroom, honestly, 30 minutes before it's my time so that I can see myself and how my facial expressions are working when I'm doing these certain monologues. Also, you want to be able to know where you can go for a safe space that is quiet to rehearse your audition. Now, do not get caught up talking to an old friend at an audition too much because that can cut into your time of preparedness. I know we all love to talk to our friends we haven't seen in a while, especially with the case of right now where it's COVID. And most of our auditions are going to be more self-tape auditions, but they're slowly starting to open back in-person auditions. Very slowly, but eventually that will be a process that's a part of it as well. So when you're going back into these rooms, please be cautious of your time. Once again, time management. Do not spend all your time talking to an old friend. You two can catch up after the audition. However, you can get some pretty good bits of information from people you know in that room. You can actually find out about future EPA auditions that you didn't know about just from word of mouth from others in the waiting area. And you don't necessarily have to be directly talking to them. I'm not going to lie. I have eavesdropped on a conversation or two. Not because I was ear hustling, but because if you're going to talk so loud, well, honey, I'm going to get the information. Also, there's a really great Facebook group called Chicago Theater Connection that talks specifically about equity auditions. If you're a part of that group, which I am, there are a few people who actually keep us updated as the process goes on for those auditions. So say you woke up late, you're just not having the best morning, and you want to get to that EPA audition, go on Chicago Theater Connection and look to see if someone has already posted about XYZ because they'll have the name of the theater, the audition day, and they'll also have equity, EMC, and non-union. And next to that, they'll have which number for each category they have seen already. And that is a huge help to those to decide whether today is your day or maybe you should try Friday or Saturday to audition. Now I will say, if you're numbers one through 10 and you are a non-union or an EMC member, please stay in that room for as long as you can. Some days these auditions happen fast. And before you know it, the EMC or non-union, we're on number 10 and it's only 1040. On those days, those are the blessing days because I've had a few of those days, but that's because I've normally gone to auditions during the week and not necessarily the weekend where more people have time to actually attend auditions. I'm not going to lie. I don't have a lot of responsibility when it comes to kids and jobs that I can't easily get a request off day for. So in my instance, that is my privilege to be able to get up and go to an audition a little more easier than I know some of us are. Also remember, the waiting area is just that. It's a waiting area. Like I said earlier, dedicate your whole day to being there. It's going to be 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. And that is a long time. However, it's worth it when you're trying to crash that EPA. You're going to be waiting a lot. And that's just what it is. Until you've booked an EMC or until you're there a day when it is moving faster, you're going to be waiting a lot longer. But don't let that deter you. I've spent times in rooms where I've waited there until 4 o'clock in the evening. And I've gotten seen. Now, you're not going to get seen every single time. But if you follow these rules, you have a greater rate of getting seen a lot sooner and a lot quicker. Now, if your life does not allow you to have a 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. of waiting in a waiting area, don't feel bad about it. Wait for as long as you can. Then hand your stapled headshot and resume to that monitor. Now, before you hand that over to that monitor, make sure your important information is on there. And when I say important information, I mean your contact information. Make sure your phone number and your email is on there. You never know if they're going to call you back because they're looking for someone to understudy. This is where you as a non-union member can really shine. Now, there are some equity theaters that are starting to follow the motto of going through agencies in order to get their audition talent. If that's the case, which sometimes you know and sometimes you don't, but just to be on the safe side, if you have an agent, make sure you put their information on your resume and headshot. If you don't have an agent, put your information. 
And to just be doubly sure, if you do have an agent and you don't know if this theater goes through agencies to get their people, put your information as well as your agent's information so they can contact you just in case they're looking for an understudy. That is how a lot of people do get their start when it comes to grabbing their EMC points. And I know I keep saying EMC, EMC, EMC. We're going to get into exactly what EMC means in just a moment. Next, know what you are auditioning for. Do not go by the motto of, well, at least they got to see me. Because that motto is not a good motto to go by. And that is because if you're not in any way what they're looking for for the upcoming season or for any of the shows in specific, you are not only wasting your time, but you're wasting their time. And when you waste their time, they're not that happy about it. I have been behind the table where we've auditioned people and they did not fit what we were looking for at all. It's as if they didn't even know what show they were coming in here to audition for. And you know what happens with that? We do not watch you leave that room after you do your amazing monologue and say, well, now that person is talented. What we say is, what did they come in here for? If you didn't fit anything that we were looking for at all. So what was the point? Don't set yourself up for failure. If you do not fit their season, if you do not fit their specific shows they're looking for, then let it go and try again next season. Now, some theaters that are equity have just general auditions, where they're not necessarily looking for a specific show or a specific season. They're just trying to see new talent. That's when you go to those auditions, where you just have that motto of, well, at least they got to see me. But when they're looking for a season or a specific show and you show up and you don't fit any of those mottos, just know you are setting yourself up for failure. Now, some shows have race specific requirements as well as age requirements. Depending on how old you are and how old you look are two totally different things. Some of us can live in between the ages of five to 15 years, either older or younger, depending on the age you look. Now, when it comes to race, you can't change that. So don't lie about what race you are because what you're doing in that instance is taking away an opportunity for someone who actually fits the motto. There are some shows that have no general race, so pay attention. Don't assume because you saw something before and it was done a certain way that that's the only way that it can be done. For example, my very first equity show was the show Steel Magnolias. Now, if you know anything about Steel Magnolias, you know it takes place in a beauty shop and it's these women and just surrounding their personal lives. Now, I'm from Louisiana, and that play takes place in Natchitoches, Louisiana, which is where I went to college as well. And there's a whole big plaque in Natchitoches, Louisiana dedicated to Still Magnolias, just fun fact. However, as a black woman, and you don't know much about Still Magnolias, and all you know is the film itself, which the original film was all white women. And then the readapted film, which was literally the exact same film, they just put black people in it, that they put on Lifetime and star Queen Latifah and the Alfie Winner. That film was all black women. And some people may think, well, oh, they did an all black adaption because that's just something that they're doing right now. No, stop yourself right there. Research these shows. For Still Magnolias, I knew for a fact because I'd already read the script that there was no race assigned to any of the ladies at the beginning of the character description. Some playwrights will have a race specific for each character and some playwrights leave it up to the director's interpretation. Now Still Magnolias has no race next to it, which means it's free game. So for me, I one, lived closer to where this audition took place, two, had my own means of transportation, three, I knew the show and I knew the show was not race specific, four, I had a Southern accent and I could make it happen. And five, I went in there with confidence. When I arrived in that room and I saw the people auditioning, I'm not gonna lie, everyone I saw was white. So it did make me a little apprehensive at first and to think that, oh wait, did I come to the right audition? I mean, I know Still McDonald's doesn't have a race attached to it, but all that is is fear. That is fear of thinking that you're not gonna get the part just because you see so many other people that don't look like you in the room, that's where you're winning. When you see people in that room that don't look like you, that means that you're the unique person that they're gonna see today. Out of the 50 or so faces, you're the one face that's different. And let that be true to who you are, no matter your race. If there are 50 blondes in the room and you're a brunette, they're gonna notice that you're a brunette when you walk in because they've seen 50 blondes. So when I went to my audition for Still Magnolias, I let that little bit of fear get me for two seconds before I sucked it on up and I said, I know that this show does not pertain to race, has nothing to do with your race, and I'm gonna book this. And what did I do? 
I got a call back after my initial audition. And in that call back, I booked it. And I was in Steel Magnolias. I received my part in Steel Magnolias, not because it just happened to be my lucky day, but because I prepared myself for success. I knew the steps I needed to follow and I knew that I can be considered for this role because I knew the show. And that's what you have to make sure you know before you step foot in that room. Now let's move on to your monologue and your attire. Now when you're picking the monologue, make sure that it's similar to the season that you're auditioning for. Some shows they have you auditioning for is for a whole entire season. And if you wanna be really bold because I am very guilty of being extremely bold, <laughs> you can audition with a monologue from the actual show. Now, some theater companies, and this is starting to be a new thing for theater companies, some theater companies actually provide you with monologues from the season that they're doing because they're like, you know what? Bypass you doing a general monologue that has nothing to do with the show. How about you just do a monologue from the show and let's see if we can fit you into this show. And that's what they're doing. I've gone on some auditions where that's been the case and it's made my life a lot easier versus me having to try to look through my rep book and figure out what exactly I'm trying to do. Now, you hear me say rep book, that's something I'll discuss in another video, but it's a very important thing to have. So take note of that. I would say that my audition for court theater when they were doing for Colored Girls, I auditioned with a monologue from the show. I wanted to make it very clear to them, I wanted that show. They had a season of shows. I didn't want those other shows. I wanted for Colored Girls. So what I did was I auditioned for a monologue with the Colored Girls. Now, for me, that worked out in my favor because that audition led to callbacks that led to me understudying two different tracks in that show. So don't think that it's a rule that you can't audition from a monologue from the specific show. I think it actually shows them this is what I'm here for so that they know what you're here for and they know that you have a direction for your own career and know what you want. Now, when it comes to attire, I would say loosely base it off what you think that character would wear, but don't feel the need to go out and buy a whole costume and props and all this other stuff. That's not necessary. If it's a period piece, I would say go in there with whatever like sh character shoes or like skirt, just so they can have a feel for how you would kind of look before they uh, cast you in that specific show. But don't feel the need to go out and buy an entirely new wardrobe, no. And if you're looking for audition pieces as far as attire, I would honestly tell you to go to thrifting stores. That is going to help you and not put a hurting on your pocket. Let's move on to who is in that room. Now, like I said, who's in that room is going to be one of the most important things you're ever gonna come across. And that is because if you've already auditioned for them recently, know that you have new material that you can show them and that can show you being elevated and better at what you're doing. Secondly, it's so that if you know these people already, you can feel a little more comfortable in the room with them. So if it's someone you've already known before, when you walk in that room, walk in there with confidence, not cockiness. Cockiness and confidence are two different things. But walk in there with the air of, I've got this, I know what I'm doing, I'm trained, and I am ready to show you the best of me. So when you're doing that, they feel an air of relief. And they're able to not be stressed <laughs> because your energy is giving them good energy back. If it's someone you've already seen before, say, hey, X, Y, and Z, so nice to finally see you again. I hope you're doing well. That also may re-trigger them to be like, I do know you. Hey, how have you been? And that allows both of you to relax a bit. And then when you're relaxed, you're able to give a better audition. And also, these equity actors who are coming here and audition for them, they are walking in with 100% confidence. So you as a non-union or EMC, you better match that confidence. When you walk in the room, that is when your audition starts, not when you say your first word. So if you walk in there like you're apologizing for even wasting their time because you're not equity, you've already set yourself up for failure. Walking there like, this is where I belong, this is where I should be, and thank you for seeing my one person show today. That's the attitude you have to have. And despite what some may tell you, those special skills are actually paid attention to. For example, on my special skills and my um, classes I've taken, I actually had taken classes from one of the casting director's husbands. And they were like, oh my gosh, you took a class from my husband. And I was like, oh really? I did? Oh, okay, who's, you know, who's your husband? I had a few classes on there. And they told me who their husband was and I was like, oh my gosh, I love your husband, he's amazing. 
And later on, they went to talk to their husband and their husband told them how much they loved me in their class. And they, I'm not saying that that helped me get a call back, but I'm not saying it didn't either. Because people want to work with people they like. People don't like working with people who are uptight or want to be difficult to work with, who don't have a personality, who aren't approachable. So pay attention when you're having those special skills and those classes on your resume and make sure you're telling the truth. Because if you are lying, they will find out. I had no idea when I walked in that room that I was going to be talking to the spouse of a teacher I had for an acting class. But I did and it paid off for me. Now let's talk about finding these EPA auditions. Now there are plenty of places that you can find an EPA audition, but the, some of the places I've struck gold personally is Broadway World and Playbill. Both of these sites, you can actually sign up to receive equity and non-equity audition notices. And what that does is every time someone posts an audition notice, whether it's equity or non-equity, they will email that notice to you. So you are staying on top of when you receive these notices and how much notice you have in advance to prepare yourself to crash these auditions. Chicago Theater Connection is a great source to figure out when EPAs are coming up. And also there are some Facebook groups that are specific to certain demographics, some depending on race, some depending on just sex. And it allows you to go into those groups and they post notices as well. So you'll hear about auditions from different things that maybe you wouldn't have heard about had you just been trying to look on Broadway World or Playbill. Also, there are sites called League of Chicago Theater and Theater in Chicago. And both of these sites also post auditions in Chicago. And a lot of times they do also post EPA auditions. With everything being more virtual at this point when it comes to auditioning and us having to do self-tapes of them, finding these auditions can be a little harder, but they're not impossible. So when you find an audition and they want you to do a self-tape for it, don't stress. Look on that notice and see if the casting person name is there in their email. If it's not, do what I do. I go a little extra step. I Google that theater, go on their website, go to their contact us page and find the casting person. And I email them and I ask for myself, are you accepting submissions from non-union and EMCs? And when you do that, you're now on these people's radar. Nine times out of 10, they're going to respond back to you. I honestly don't think I've ever not received a response back from a casting department of a theater. They respond back and they tell you either, yes, we're accepting self tapes from you as well, or no, we're not at this time. But some of them also have general auditions where they see people outside of the equity realm. So that can also be a way in to you getting some EMC points. And I know I'm talking about EMC points and I still haven't explained what any of that means, but I am going to. So calm down. I'm going to get there. I promise. Now, I would say the last way that you can find these equity auditions is like I said earlier, word of mouth. I know I mentioned word of mouth and what I mean by word of mouth is you hear someone say something or someone tells you about, hey, so-and-so show is auditioning just for that show, specifically that show. Did you hear about it? You say no and you can know what you do if you have an agent. It's a win-win situation. You call your agent. Yes, I said call. We don't email our agents these things. We call them these things, depending on your relationship, that is. Me, I'm a very bold person. So when my agent, depending on my relationship with which agent that I have, depending on your relationship as well, let their best response method be what that is. Me, I get eager sometimes. So I'm like, hey, I don't know if you know, but I'm trying to tell you I could book this. <laughs> so it's very important to hit your agent up if you have an agent and say, hey, can you help me get in that room? Your agent is there to help you get a audition. And sometimes with equity theaters, it looks good when they see an agent's trying to boost for you. And what that does is that puts you more on their radar. Tell your agent you want to audition for this equity show. Let them contact whoever they have to contact on their end to get you in that room for a slot for an actual audition for them. And then what you do is you wait a few days, hit your agent back up, and hit them up until they have your yes or no. And I mean that. Your agent doesn't get paid until you get paid. And if they want to get paid and you know it's a show that you can book or at least get a call back for or at least understudy for, they're still getting paid. So make sure that they are working for you and helping you secure that job that you want so your career can go to that next level for yourself. 
And when you're doing this, some agents may not know that you're that talented in theater. Some, you know, it just depends on your relationship. So you sell yourself to your agent. I've done this a few times with my agents. I've let them know that, hey, I'm looking at this equity show. I know how good I am. I know this material. I know all of this. I Every time I'm going for an equity audition, I get a call back. You boost yourself up so that your agent feels even more confident when they're selling you to that specific theater so they can get you an audition slot. And to be honest, when it comes to auditioning, it's one part talent and the rest is up in the air depending on how everything plays out that day. You can give them an amazing audition and if they're just looking for one specific character and they've already cast everyone else and you're just too short or too tall or, you know, it's, it, it, certain things are without your control. So if you don't book it, it's not the end of the world. You've done all the steps to make it up to the point to booking it, so don't stress it. Now, let's finally move on to this EMC program, people. EMC, what does that acronym even mean? EMC means Equity Membership Candidate. And I have my own EMC card. I'll insert it right here. Now, that is what you enroll in once you book your first equity show. And I'm going to be honest with you. Let's get to the point where you've already auditioned, you've crashed this EPA, you've booked this show, and now you're talking to them about your contract. Because nothing is final until you have signed your name on that dotted line, honey. And even then, contracts can be pulled. So before you sign that contract because you're so excited to finally be in an equity show, you need to ask them, are they a part of the EMC program? And I'm gonna be honest with you. If they are not, I think you should do what's best for you. However, for myself and my personal career, I would not accept their contract, especially if I'm not already equity. If you're non-union or you're EMC and you're aiming to become equity, you need to know in advance before you sign two months of your life away if they're gonna benefit you not only monetarily, but union-wise. And if you don't know which theaters are EMC approved, then all you have to go on is the Actors' Equity website. They have an updated list that's constantly being updated about which theaters are, what kind of contracts they have, what tier, and who is an EMC theater. They have it broken down in alphabetical order. They also have where these theaters are located. So don't feel like it's so much of a burden that you can't figure it out. Just a little research, and it's all going to fall into your fingertips. But I would not personally, for myself and my career, would not accept a contract from an equity theater that is not going to also offer me EMC points. Now, these points that I'm talking about, they determine when and if you join equity. One point equals one week. And what that means is, say you're at a theater, they have EMC points, you signed your contract, you're ready to go. And say you signed for a seven-week contract, two and a half week of rehearsal, and the rest is shows. Now, seven-week contract equals to seven points, which means you now have seven points in the EMC program with the union. And when you get your EMC paperwork, make sure you take photocopies of this. Keep all of this stuff for your files, just in case some freak accident happens where equity loses your paperwork or the theater loses your paperwork. You have your paperwork in order. Now, your EMC registration form will be provided to you by either the producer of the theater or whoever's in charge of your show that you're doing. You're going to hand them a $200 check as well, which goes towards your union fees once you actually join the union. So any money that you're sending towards the union is going to be deducted when it finally comes time for you to officially join equity completely. Now, after you've signed their paperwork, giving them their $200, you're going to get in the mail at some point an EMC card. That EMC card is to be in your wallet at all times. That is a very important factor when it comes to you auditioning and crashing these auditions. If you're an EMC member and you forgot your EMC card at the house, nobody cares because you can only sign the official EMC list with that monitor after you've shown them your EMC card. Yep. After. So if you do not walk out of that door with that stapled headshot and resume and your EMC card, you are automatically setting yourself up for failure. Now, how many weeks do you need before you can join equity? 25. It used to be 50 weeks, but that changed in 2018. Now they've cut that in half and you only need 25 weeks before you can join equity. And like I said, one point equals one week. Now let's talk about 
to join AEA or not to join AEA? I think this is a very personal question and it determines where you are in your career at that moment. If you're booking a lot of equity theater, then great, join right now. But if you're not, don't fret. You have five years to figure it all out before those points go to waste. But also when it comes time to join officially equity, oh honey, they tell you right away. My last equity show I did put me over the 25 week cap and literally the next morning, like 12 a.m., the equity office emailed me and said, hey, you can join equity now, what are you gonna do? And what that means is, are you going to join equity right now? Or are you going to join phase two of the program? Because that is a thing now, phase two, where you pay another $200, which also goes to the final membership fee of actually joining equity, where you are not going to join right now. You're gonna give yourself a little time to figure out where you wanna do and when you wanna join. But what that does is allow you to join whenever you want to. At any point in time, you can join equity. And that is what the phase two does for you. And it can be costly. A lot of these unions and a lot of these things, they aren't cheap. So if you're still trying to figure it out, don't feel like your time limit is set at a certain time. Now for you to join phase two to where you're allowed to keep those EMC points, that is a time limit. That is going to have a time limit on it. And normally it's about two months. So make sure you're very aware of the time limit so that you can have the extra $200 to go ahead and start going into phase two of, I'll join when I feel I'm ready. I'm not going to join right now because you don't have those thousands of dollars. Now, how much is it to join? It is a bit expensive, like I just stated. The initiation fee is $1,700. And you don't have to pay it all right away, but you have to pay that within the span of two years. If you're working on equity contracts and you decided, hey, I'm going to join equity, but you have the two year span, what they do is from your paychecks, they deduct a certain amount of money out of your check so that it can go towards your final fee of joining the union. And come 2022, that fee is going to go to $1,800 to join the union. That's it. That's all. That's everything you need to know about crashing EPAs. I'm so happy to let you know how to crash your EPA because I've been doing it for the past two years before this pandemic hit. And within two years, I was able to join equity because I stuck to this routine that I am telling you about. This isn't something that I haven't tried. This is a tried and true routine for myself. Now let me know for yourself. Are you ready to go in there and kill it? Like I always say, y'all stay safe out there and I'll see you online next time.